All right. Well, it is Easter 2020. Welcome again, everybody. And as we open our service, uh, I would like I would like everybody to uh, to recite with me if you know it. Uh, if you don't know it, you can just listen along. But we're going to be reciting our statement of faith here this morning. Uh, this is the Apostles' Creed. And so uh, those of us who are here this morning, those of you who know it, you can say it with us. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, today is the day that we celebrate the resurrection of Christ from the dead. Now, I think all of us are familiar with the Easter story. We know that on Palm Sunday that Jesus rode into Jerusalem in a way that showed everyone that he was the long-awaited Messiah. And the people recognized that. They even proclaimed Jesus' identity as Messiah by referring to him as the Son of David. Their proclamations, however, were short-lived because just a couple of days later, the same people that were proclaiming Jesus as Messiah were also shouting for his crucifixion. Judas, one of the 12 apostles, arranged to betray Jesus and handed him over to the religious leaders. And even though Jesus had done nothing wrong, Jesus was arrested, falsely accused, given an unfair trial, and then he was beaten beyond recognition. Finally, he was nailed to a cross where he hung for six hours, and he spoke his last words, it is finished, and then he died. After his death, scripture tells us that a man by the name of Joseph of Arimathea, who was a secret follower of Jesus, asked the Roman governor if he could take care of the body of Jesus. The governor gave him permission, and so Joseph, along with Nicodemus, uh, who was part of the Sanhedrin, Nicodemus is the same Nicodemus that came to Jesus by night in John chapter 3. He was the man whom Jesus spoke John 3.16 to, this Nicodemus, also a follower of Jesus. So Joseph of Arimathea, along with Nicodemus, took Jesus' body down from the cross, wrapped it in burial cloths, and they placed it in a new tomb that was nearby. And we're told that Jesus' mother Mary, along with Mary Magdalene, observed the whole process and saw where Jesus' body was laid to rest. Now, if this were the end of the story, I would not be standing here today. If Jesus' death was the end of the story, we probably wouldn't even know about Jesus. And maybe he may have made it into history as a, as a small, insignificant footnote. But we certainly really wouldn't have heard of him. He would not be uh, a name as popular as, as it is today. It would just be the sad end to a promising young man. But fortunately for us and for the rest of the world, this is not the end of the story. Jesus did not stay in the grave. He rose triumphant from the dead, defeating the devil and purchasing our freedom from sin and from death. And what I want to do now is take a look at what happened immediately following the resurrection of Jesus. And as I mentioned uh, before I started the sermon, we're going to be reading a lot of scripture today. So I invite you to grab your Bibles and follow along with me. We're going to be starting in Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. And I'm going to be starting at verse 10. Matthew 28, 1 to 10. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. 
The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. So here we get a look at what happened at the resurrection of Jesus. As the two Marys were heading to the tomb, Scripture tells us that there was a violent earthquake. It says that an angel came down from heaven, rolled back the stone that was over the grave, and it says that Jesus walked out of the tomb. Now, when Jesus walked out of the tomb, he did not walk out as a bloodied and bruised man who had just been killed. But when Jesus came out, it says that he looked like lightning, bright and glowing with clothes that were white as snow. Now, I just want to put in a quick uh, side note here. I know on the live stream that my shirt almost looks like it's glowing because it's a mostly white shirt. Um, I did not do that on purpose because of this. <laughs> okay. Just happens to be the way the light is hitting my shirt. And for the record, it's not totally white. It's got uh, stripes and stuff on it. So if I happen to be glowing uh, on your live stream, uh, you know, it's just don't think anything of it. <laughs> but anyway, Jesus came out of the grave glowing with clothes that were white as snow. And it freaked the guards out, as you can imagine. I mean, I don't know about you, but I would most definitely be completely freaking out if I saw a stone rolled away and a dead man walking out of the tomb, okay? Uh, and it says that they were so freaked out that they became like dead men. In other words, they were so overcome that they could no longer stand and they fell to the ground. Now, I want to make, make it clear that they didn't pass out. They saw everything that happened and as you'll read later in the chapter, and we'll talk about toward the end of the message, they saw and witnessed everything that happened, and they went back and reported what they saw. Now, I'm too the, sure that the two Marys were freaked out as well. But then the angel spoke to them, and in and and verse uh, 5, it says, The angel sp said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Now I love how the angel starts off, Don't be afraid. Okay, you, you often see that uh, in Scripture when angels appear. That oftentimes some of their first words are, don't be afraid because, again, if you think about it practically, if an angel suddenly appeared to you, again, wouldn't you be a little afraid at first? I think most of us probably would. So the angel's like, no, it's okay. It's okay. The women came to grieve, and they found out through the angel that Jesus was alive. I can only imagine how excited these women must have been as they turned to run back to tell the disciples this good news. In fact, I love, absolutely love what happens next. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 9, says this, Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Now, I personally don't think that Jesus' first words were greetings. I think that was maybe a little sanitized, okay? Because I, I, I picture Jesus as somebody with a really great sense of humor, okay? I mean, in my opinion, he had to have a good sense of humor to hang out with the disciples for three years, okay? <laughs> he really did. And so, you know, yeah, they, it says that Jesus appeared to them and said greetings. I kind of think that he kind of appeared and maybe struck a pose. Hey, what's up, ladies? How you doing? You know, however it was, Jesus appeared to the women and imagine their amazement. First, the angel tells them that Jesus is alive. Then they see Jesus and their natural reaction is to fall at his feet and worship. I know someday I'm going to see Jesus. And I'm convinced that's going to be my reaction as well. I think it'd be the natural reaction of most of us when we see him. And Jesus tells the women to go tell his brothers, tell his disciples, go to Galilee and you will see me there. Now, just as a side note here, I absolutely love the fact that the people who were the first 
to witness the resurrection, the first to tell about the resurrection, the people that Jesus chose to go tell the other disciples that he had risen from the dead were women. Now, back in this culture, in this society, women were treated not much different than livestock. In fact, oftentimes livestock was treated better than women, quite frankly. Women did not have a place of of value in society other than taking care of the home, cooking meals, having babies. That was pretty much it. Women were not allowed to testify in a court of law. So if a woman came and said, I saw this happen, oftentimes they would not be trusted enough to talk about it in a court of law. Very much second-class citizens. Yet Jesus decided, I'm going to let some women tell my news first. See, because in society, women may not have been very valuable, but to Jesus, incredible value. No difference in value than anybody else. Jesus, in my opinion, was the original feminist. But anyway, that's another message for, for another time. But he tells these women to go to the city, tell his disciples what they have seen and heard, and that he would appear to them in Galilee. And the women do just as Jesus said and told the other disciples. Now, where were these disciples when Jesus sent the women to tell them? The disciples were gathered together, sad and depressed over what had happened. Now, why were they sad and depressed? I I spoke about this a little bit uh, on my uh, live broadcast on Friday. But uh, I want to go ahead and just reiterate here. The disciples were convinced that Jesus was the Messiah. And according to everything that they had been taught, everything that they believed, the Messiah was going to come and reestablish David's throne. In other words, what, what that meant was that the Messiah would come, deliver Israel from her enemies, and would sit upon a throne and would reign forever upon this throne, and that Israel would be a nation of peace and would be a blessing to the world. They got this from Old Testament or Old Covenant uh, prophecies. And yes, those prophecies are there. Yes, Jesus is going to come back. Yes, Jesus is going to sit on a throne and reign forever. But not yet. That's something that's going to be coming in the future. They missed some portions of scripture. So here these disciples were convinced that Jesus was the Messiah. And they were convinced that he was going to start a rebellion against the Roman Empire who was occupying Israel at that time. That Rome would be defeated and driven out and that Israel would once again be a sovereign nation, God's chosen people, that the Messiah, Jesus, would sit on David's throne, would reign forever. And of course, the disciples, the apostles especially, probably figured that they would hold a very special place in this new kingdom, that they would be people of importance. So they were most definitely looking forward to Jesus doing this. Imagine how they felt when the man that they were convinced was the Messiah had died. He was buried. The tomb was sealed. Their dreams were crushed. I have no doubt that they were experiencing an extreme crisis of faith at that moment. Depression, I think, is an understatement. To say that they were depressed would be like saying that water is wet. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's very obvious, very much an understatement, okay? These men and women were crushed. Had they been deceived the past three years? How could somebody who did the things that Jesus did not be the Messiah? Yet in their minds, he couldn't be because he died. So these disciples then hear these women say that Jesus was alive, that he had risen from the dead, and that they had even seen Jesus themselves. Now, of course, this was a message that was too good to be true. And some of the disciples did not believe the women. And I'll be honest with you, I don't blame them. I don't blame them at all. If somebody that I loved and admired had died and was buried, and then somebody told me a few days later that they saw this person alive, I would say, you're nuts. 
They're dead. They're not alive. You're crazy. Your grief has driven you insane. You're seeing things. You're imagining things. There's some nice young people in nice white coats in this padded room that really want to have a conversation with you. Okay? It would be what we would be thinking. So I don't blame the disciples that doubted at all. However, two of the disciples are so overcome with this news that they have to check it out themselves. So let's flip over to the Gospel of John, chapter 20. John, chapter 20. I'm going to be starting at verse 3. John, chapter 20, verse 3. So Peter and the other disciple, and I'll pause right there, the other disciple spoken of here is the Apostle John, uh, the, uh, the author of this Gospel. Um, and so in this society, people typically when they wrote did not refer to themselves directly. It was considered kind of arrogant and boastful to refer to yourselves very directly like that. And so they would often use indirect references to themselves. So when John wrote this, you know, he referred to himself as the other disciple. So again, John chapter 20, verse 3. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. So they both run to check out the empty tomb, still not totally convinced that what the women had said was true. And it says that they looked in and they saw the strips of linen, and this was the linen that would have been wrapped around Jesus' body. You know, again, a very normal practice in first century in Israel. They would wrap linen strips around the body, and it, they saw those linen strips laying there. But it says it wasn't until they saw the burial cloth that was wrapped around Jesus' head that was laying there separate from the linen, folded, that they believed. Now, why was this? I've spoken about this here at Harvest before, but uh, this is just such an amazing thing that it's, it's great to be uh, reminded of. Every Orthodox Jewish person back then and even today has a prayer shawl. Now, I am not Orthodox Jewish, but I have a prayer shawl as well. Brenda, would you come up and help me show this? I kind of need two hands here. If you could unfold that and show it. This is a, a prayer shawl that a, a Jewish man would have worn. Okay? And you'll notice on the ends there are tassels. And there's significance behind each knot in each of these tassels. If you Google it and uh, look up the significance, it's really awesome. I would encourage you to do that. You'll, you'll definitely be blessed by, uh, by studying that. But uh, they would wear the prayer shawl like this. They would wear it around their shoulders like this, especially when they would go and worship. Many Orthodox Jews then and today as well uh, wear their, their shawls or their tassels all the time. Like uh, you'll often see an Orthodox Jewish man walking around with tassels hanging out from underneath his, his shirt. Okay, it's uh, representative of the prayer cloth. But when they go to worship, they'll be wearing their, their prayer shawl. And when it comes time to pray, they do this. They put it on their head. In fact, when Jesus talked about, uh, he said, yeah, when you pray, go into your closet and pray by yourself. Here's what Jesus meant. Like, he didn't necessarily mean, like, literally go to your closet, crawl in there and pray. When he referred to going to your closet, what he, what he would refer to is oftentimes when uh, the, the Jewish men, when they would want to pray in private, they would take their prayer shawl and they would bring it over their face like this. And basically what they're doing is they're shutting themselves off from distractions around, the, around them. This, this would have been considered their closet. And so they're going in and they're, they're doing this to pray by themselves. I'll get it. Here we go. Anyway. <laughs> so 
I know it's not right. But anyway, the prayer shawl was a very important part of a Jewish man's worship. And when a Jewish man would go to worship and they would take their prayer shawl off, they would fold it up. Now, every prayer shawl pretty much looked the same. Okay, so picture this. You've got, let's say, 20 men together. Uh, but let's, let's even go more direct. Jesus and his 12 disciples. You have 13 men together. All of them have prayer shawls. Jesus would have had a prayer shawl. All of them have prayer shawls. And when they fold them up and set them down, how are you going to tell one person's prayer shawl from another? Well, the way that they would do it is every Jewish man had a unique way that they would fold their prayer shawl. They would figure out a way to fold it, so just by looking at it being folded, they could tell that it was theirs. And their folded prayer shawls were so unique, it was kind of like a signature or handwriting today. Like, if you really know somebody, you can tell by their handwriting. Like, I promise you, if my wife comes across a piece of paper in my house with handwriting on it, if that was written by anybody in my house, she will know who it was. She'll know if it was me. She'll know if it was one of my four children. She will know if it's her. Why? Because she knows our handwriting. She can recognize our handwriting because she's seen it often. And it's just like that with a prayer shawl. If you hang around people, you'll be able to recognize their prayer shawl by how it was folded. And just like I might be able to recognize somebody else's handwriting, uh, unless I do a ton of practicing, I'm not going to be able to duplicate it. Yes, if I practice enough, I could probably bring across a passable forgery of their, of their signature. But I'm not going to be able to duplicate it exactly. And it's the same thing with folding a prayer shawl. Unless you really practiced, you would not be able to fold it exactly the way that that person folded theirs. So how does this come into the burial cloth? Well, when a Jewish man would die, they would take his prayer shawl, rip a corner of it, and then use that prayer shawl to wrap around their head. So the burial cloth that was wrapped around Jesus' head was actually his prayer shawl. And so when Peter and John got to the tomb and they looked in there and they saw the linen, okay, any grave robber could have taken the linen off Jesus' body and left it there, okay? I don't know why they would, but if they wanted to, they could, all right? But they looked and they saw Jesus' prayer shawl that would have been wrapped around his head, folded, laying there separate from the linen. Why did they believe when they saw that folded prayer shawl? because it was folded in exactly the way that Jesus folded it. They knew it wasn't one of them because they were all gathered together. It couldn't have been one of them, and they were the ones that were closest to Jesus. They were the, would be the only ones that may possibly be able to duplicate that. Any grave robber would not know how Jesus folded his prayer shawl. But there was Jesus' prayer shawl folded the way he folded it. There was no doubt at all all in the minds of Peter and John that Jesus was alive because he folded his prayer shawl his way and it was laying there. The story doesn't end here though. We're going to flip back to Luke chapter 24. Gospel of Luke chapter 24. This is after Jesus had been uh, raised from the dead. This was after Peter and John had come to the tomb. So I'm starting in Luke chapter 24. Verse 13, Luke 24, 13 says, Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And the two of them was referring to two of Jesus' disciples, not one of the 12 apostles, but two of Jesus' disciples. So they were traveling down the road about seven miles uh, to, a, to a village called Emmaus. Verse 14, they were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. 
About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. So these two disciples were walking and talking about everything that had happened. Now, what was this? It was, of course, the crucifixion of Jesus. And they ran across Jesus He came up to them while they were on the road, but we're told that Jesus kept them from recognizing who he was. Now, that makes me wonder, why did Jesus not want them to know who he was? Because as you'll see in a moment, Jesus needed to teach them some things. And I don't know that they would have been able to really pay attention if they knew who Jesus was. If they would have recognized this individual as Jesus, they probably would have been so excited and overcome that anything that Jesus would have said to them probably would not have gotten through. And so for this reason, because Jesus had to teach them some things, he kept them from recognizing him. So Jesus asked them about what they were talking about, and and they recapped the events of the previous days about about Jesus' death and resurrection. And and they even made the comment, we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel, showing that they did not understand Jesus' mission, showing that their opinion about what Jesus was there to do was the same as everybody else's, that he was a Messiah who was going to come and, and conquer and, and remove Rome from Israel and reestablish David's throne. You know, that's what they were hoping for. And they're like, you know, we really wanted him to be this Messiah. We really hoped and expected that he was, but he obviously wasn't because he died. So continuing in Luke chapter 24, verse 25. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. This is the lesson that Jesus wanted to teach them. They needed to learn what scripture had to say about Jesus. Now, I have no idea what Jesus told them or how he went about doing it, but when Jesus was done, they were convinced that the Messiah had to come and suffer. Verse 28 of Luke chapter 24. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it's nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Now, can you imagine again how they must have felt knowing that they were in the presence of Jesus the whole time? They were in Jesus' presence but didn't realize it. And, you know, I'm convinced that there are many Christians today that are like these two disciples. Oh, they love Jesus. But they're expecting Jesus to be something that Jesus is not. Or not yet. Their version of Jesus is very different than Jesus really is. And when you expect Jesus to behave in a way that Jesus doesn't behave, it's very easy to miss when Jesus is there with you. And I think that we as a church quite often have our own version of Jesus that has nothing to do with the real Jesus. And so when the presence of Jesus is with us, we often don't even recognize it. 
because we're expecting something else. Verse 33. They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem where they found the 11 and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. They were startled and frightened thinking that they saw a ghost. And again, everyone freaks out thinking that it's a ghost, and I can't blame them. People didn't come back to life from the dead like this. I mean, yes, Jesus rose Lazarus from the dead, rose, you know, the girl from the dead. You know, Jesus did some of that, those miracles, but they, that was the last thing that the disciples were thinking. They, they weren't even fathoming that Jesus was going to rise from the dead, even though if you read scripture, Jesus repeatedly told them, that he was going to die and come back three days later, okay? Uh, they just weren't paying attention to that because, again, it didn't line up with their version of the Messiah. So the two disciples tell them everything that they had experienced. Jesus appears in the midst of them. People freak out thinking it's a ghost. And then Jesus calms them down, verse 38 of Luke chapter 24, verse 38. He said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took and ate in their presence. So Jesus eventually convinces them that he's not a ghost, even though he says, hey, you know, touch my hands, my feet, touch me. Ghosts don't have flesh and blood. They're not solid like I am. And then to fully convince them, he's like, hey, you guys got anything to eat? He sits down and eats a meal, which is, again, something you wouldn't expect a ghost to sit down and, and actually eat food. And Jesus does this in front of them. Verse 44, he said to them, this is what I told you when I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. So Jesus proceeds to tell them what the scripture says about him. And I love how it says that Jesus opened their minds so they could understand what scripture has to say. Now we come to the so what portion of my message. Now, some of you might be thinking, all right, Pastor Harry, this, this is a great story. It's pretty awesome. Yeah, we understand this is the Easter message, but what does this have to do with my life right now? How does this story impact me where I am at at this moment? Well, I think there are three things that we need to look at in applying this message to us. The first thing that I'd like to, uh, like to look out, the first main point that I, I would like to bring out is this. Everyone missed out on why Jesus came. Everyone missed out on why Jesus came. Now, what do I mean? Remember when I mentioned what people were expecting of the Messiah? How they were expecting a conquering king, not a suffering servant? They all missed it. They were not expecting Jesus in the way that Jesus came. The crowds missed it, although that really doesn't surprise me too much. The, the attitude and outlook of the general public is, is sadly all too fickle. It, it really is. The public is very easily swayed into psychology and, and look at groupthink and, and those sorts of things. It, it explains why we are that way. And, and just I want to make a, a, a very good point right here. It's very easy for us to point at others and say, oh yeah, look at those sheep and how easily they are deceived. Don't forget that you're one of the sheep and so am I. 
all of us, you and me included, are very easily deceived at times, especially when we come to groupthink and, and other things of that nature. When everybody around us, around us believes a certain way, when we've been raised believing a specific thing to be fact, and that's what everybody around us believes, of course we're going to believe the exact same thing. It's natural. Now, not everybody will. Sometimes you'll get people who by nature are skeptical and will, will think and, and come up with their own ideas and thoughts and notions. And we typically don't like those people. We call them rebels. Uh, you know, we call them liberals. We call them all kinds of other things and, and don't want anything to do with them because they think differently than us. But the crowds missed who Jesus was and why Jesus came. And, and again, I'm not surprised that the crowds missed it. I am, however, surprised that the disciples missed it. They had spent three years day in and day out with Jesus. If anybody should have known who Jesus was, it should have been the disciples. Now, they recognized Jesus as Messiah, but that's when their preconceived notions and ideas, that's when their confirmation bias came in. Oh, Jesus is the Messiah, and, and this is what we were always taught that the Messiah was going to do, so Jesus must be ready to do this. Even though they heard Jesus say several times that he would be killed but would rise again three days later, they still missed out on Jesus' true mission because of their own bias. However, the ones that really surprised me in missing out on who Jesus was and why he came were the religious leaders. If anybody should have recognized Jesus for who he was, it should have been them. If anyone should have understood what Scripture said about the Messiah that would come and die on a cross to set us free from sin and death, it should have been them. Why do I say that? Because the religious leaders were the ones that studied the scriptures intently. Most people back then could not read. It was the responsibility of the religious leaders to do the reading and the studying for the general public and teach the general public what the scriptures had to say. So they would have known the scriptures. In fact, many of them, if not most of them, had the entire Hebrew scriptures, what we call the Old Testament, had it memorized or mostly memorized, committed to memory. We're not talking about slackers here. These were highly intelligent individuals who spent their days studying and interpreting the scriptures. They knew scripture inside and out, but they missed it. Why? Because of their own preconceived ideas and notions, their own confirmation bias. And it's easy for us to look at the crowds and the disciples and the religious leaders and wonder how they could have missed such things. But before we start judging them, I think we need to take a close look at ourselves. Because we have the advantage of hindsight. It's easy to see what's happening when you know the whole story. But more than that, I wonder how many of us today are missing out on who Jesus is. How many of us today have been taught a version of God, of Jesus, of the Holy Spirit that is not accurate? Oh, maybe we can see it in Scripture. Maybe we can pluck out verses here and there to support our position. But we're missing it. Just because I can pluck a verse out doesn't mean that that's what the verse is saying. Doesn't mean that that's what's really going on. Because oftentimes what the Bible says and what the Bible means are two different things. You've heard me say this before. Let me just clarify before anybody calls me a heretic, okay? I preached on this a couple of weeks ago. Jesus said that if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Did Jesus literally mean pluck out your eye and cut off your hand? No, which I'm very grateful for because if he literally meant that, I wouldn't have eyes or hands, and probably you wouldn't either. You know, that's not what Jesus meant. It's what he said, but it's not what he meant. And, and there are many times that people will pluck verses out of Scripture to get their own inaccurate view of who God and who Jesus and who the Holy Spirit, you know, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit are, and they miss it. But this is what the Bible says, Harry. Yeah, I get that's what it says, but what does it mean? 
Is that really who God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are? If you want to know how God the Father is, Jesus said, look at him. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. In other words, if you have seen me and know how I am, you know exactly how God the Father is. So I'll tell you right now, any version of God the Father that does not look like Jesus is an inaccurate view of God the Father. I'll say that again. Any version of God the Father that does not look like Jesus is an inaccurate view of God the Father. But what about this verse, Harry? Okay, just follow me here. If a verse that I pluck out of Scripture does not look like Jesus, therefore it can't be God the Father, but that verse doesn't look like what God the Father would be if that really was God the Father, that means one of two things. It means either the Bible's wrong or I am wrong. See, I have no problem saying that the Bible is inspired. I have no problem saying that the Bible is infallible. I believe that the Bible is inspired and infallible. But I know that I am not always inspired, and I am definitely not infallible. My interpretation can be wrong. And so if the way I'm looking at that verse doesn't look like Jesus, that means I'm wrong. There's something else going on. That's another message for another time. I don't want to get distracted here. But the problem is, we can miss out on who Jesus is because we have our preconceived ideas of what Jesus is supposed to be. If we approach scriptures with our ideas of who Jesus is, we tend to fit scripture into our ideas, but it should be the other way around. We should fit our ideas into scripture. If we come from a legalistic, rule-following background, we'll approach scripture with the same attitude. Picturing a Jesus as a heavenly bully waiting for us to mess up so he can punish us. Now, before I go any further, I'll just let you know, I, I know that I have some of it wrong. I know that my theology is not 100% correct. Nobody's is. I'm doing the best I can to make sure that my theology is accurate. I try to keep myself in a position where I'm always willing to learn and be corrected. And so that means that I need to do something. This brings me to second, my second point today. Second point is Jesus had to open their minds. In John 3, 9, we read about Peter and John. It says they still didn't understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. They didn't get it. They didn't understand in Luke 24, 31, we, we read about the two disciples that walked with Jesus on the road without recognizing him. And, and it says, then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. A few verses later, after Jesus appeared to the other disciples, we read, then Jesus opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. What I need to do and what you need to do is pray and ask Jesus to open our minds to the truth of scripture. Because we all approach scripture with baggage, with our culture, our education, our family, our, upgrade, our upbringing, our beliefs, etc. And we need to ask Jesus to help us set all of that aside and to see scripture for what it is, not what we are told that it is, and not, that, not what we want it to be. Ask Jesus to reveal himself to you, and I promise you that he will. My final point, and this point honestly, is kind of scary. Some who knew the truth still rejected Jesus. Some who knew the truth still rejected Jesus. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28, I'm going to start in verse 11. It says this, while the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. The guards that were at the tomb 
that witnessed everything that happened, that saw Jesus rise from the dead, that knew that Jesus was who he claimed to be, went back and told the religious leaders what they saw. At that moment, the religious leaders knew the truth. They knew that Jesus was the Messiah. They knew that Jesus was the Son of God. They knew that Jesus was exactly who he claimed to be. Yet, rather than repent and admit that they were wrong, they tried to hide the fact. They tried to cover things up. They gave the guards money and said, tell this lie. And if word gets back to the governor that you, know, that you were asleep, we'll, we'll make sure that, that he doesn't punish you. Because, I mean, anybody that's ever been in the military and ever had to, to work guard duty, I mean, there's some pretty serious consequences if you're found sleeping on guard duty. And back in this day with the, with the Roman soldiers, if you were found sleeping on guard duty, you could be put to death. There were some pretty serious consequences. So, you know, the, the religious leader said, I'll just take this money, tell this lie that the disciples stole the body, and we'll make sure that you don't get in any trouble. And so the soldiers did it. They, they took the money. They were bought out. The religious leaders chose to reject the truth. And I'm sure that they all had their reasons, but it completely blows my mind that when faced with the truth, they chose to hide it to save face. I'm asking you this morning, don't reject the truth. I'm asking you to remember that just like the people in the first century missed out on who Jesus really was, that, that we can do the exact same thing. I'm asking you to remember to ask God to open your minds to the truth, no matter how scary or uncomfortable that truth might be. And I tell you, it can be scary and it can be uncomfortable, especially if to be in your community, you have to believe in a certain way. And yet you come to realize that that way might not be the actual way. The truth might be something different than what your community thinks. That's hard. It's brutal. There's some tough decisions that need to be made. Yet, I would ask you not to hide from the truth that God has revealed to you. Now, I'm not saying go into it flippantly or believe everything you hear, or whatever thought comes into your mind. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying after you have studied, after you have prayed, after you have agonized over this and looked into it as much as you can and you realize that my community of people believe differently than what I think reality is, you're now faced with a choice of what you're going to do with that. Are you going to conform and continue? Are you going to challenge? And in challenging, you can be rejected. It's dangerous. It hurts. You're going to be wounded by people that you would have never imagined would ever wound you. I know this because it's happened to me. I've shared this briefly, and someday I'm going to share the entire story. It's, that day is not today, but I went through a brutal deconstruction of my faith. It was something that, that lasted for about seven or eight years, the deconstructing and the reconstructing. I deconstructed to the point that I was this close to being an agnostic. I was getting up in my pulpit every Sunday preaching things that I didn't even think were true or wasn't sure if they were true. I didn't know, but I preached them because it was what I was taught. It was because what tradition said. It was because what, it was what I had believed, but in my heart I didn't really know if I believed that or not. Now, thankfully, God did bring me through a period of, of reconstruction or reframing, however you want to state it. My faith has been reconstructed completely. And I can say beyond a shadow of a doubt right now that my faith is deeper than it's ever been. I've never been closer to God than I am right now. I am so thankful for that brutal period of deconstruction and reconstruction. But during that period of reconstruction, some of my beliefs have changed. Now, I can honestly say most of the people that I talk to are okay 
with how my beliefs have changed. I've talked with several of my uh, my you know, pastoral colleagues uh, about how some of my beliefs have changed. And although they may disagree with me, they still call me brother. But I've had some whose response has been downright nasty. Responses that have absolutely nothing to do with the way that God would want somebody to respond. Like low blow, sucker punch, stab you in the back kind of response. So I know it's not easy, but I can tell you it's worth it. It's worth it. Ask God to open your mind to the truth, whatever that truth might be. I'm also asking you to remember why we are celebrating today. Because on Good Friday, when Jesus was crucified, that is the day that the old covenant was finished, the new covenant began, that we were able to leave the, 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 uh, the covenant of, of sin and of death, and that we were able to enter into the new covenant of love, of grace, of mercy. The day that our sins were paid for, we were set free. Easter, Resurrection Sunday, is the day that Jesus triumphed over death. The price was paid. He triumphed over death. He is alive. He is ready to return. I would not be surprised at all to see his return in my lifetime. He's ready to return. He's a God that's worth following. We're celebrating the truth today that Jesus died, Jesus was resurrected, and that Jesus is coming again. Or, as my liturgical family says, Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for the cross. I thank you for the resurrection. And I pray, just as you did with the disciples, that you would open our minds. Show us the truth. Help us to read the scriptures in the right way, to understand uh, the difference between truth and error, to understand who you really are, to understand the central message of scripture, that through Jesus, we're free. Through Jesus, we are redeemed. Through Jesus, we are no longer under the bondage of sin or under the curse of death. And Lord, I just pray for anybody right now who's listening that has not given their life to you, that you would start to stir in their hearts right now. Let them know that they, it would be good to make this step. I just pray right now, Lord, that they would take that step, commit their lives to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I've said a lot today, some of which maybe you're a little confused with, some maybe you don't agree with totally, some maybe you need a little more information, whatever. I am more than happy to help out however I can. So if you'd like to talk, if you'd like to know more about what it means to give your life to Christ, if you have questions or, or would like to sit down and talk about why I believe a certain thing that I believe, please contact me, let me know. I uh, will gladly do that. So thank you very much for your time today. Hope you have a blessed Easter. God bless.